Welcome back to The Mining Pod. We're excited to debut our holiday specials, beginning with Charlie Shoemaker, VP of Communications at Marathon Digital. In this wide-ranging interview, we talk about Marathon's 2022, including the shutdown of their heart in Montana site, getting nine extra hash of miners back online, OFAC compliance, ESG regulations, financing for Marathon, and why they haven't sold any of their Bitcoin yet. Charlie, welcome to The Mining Pod. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Lots to talk about. We should start off with SBF, Binance, FTX News. Yeah. A few acronyms in there. We're recording this on Wednesday, November 9th. Yesterday, we learned that Binance was possibly looking at buying FTX after FTX's possible but likely insolvency came to light. And this morning, we found out that Binance might not be buying them. Yeah. I'm sure by the time we publish this, most of this news will be kind of done at this point. We'll figure out what those teams are going to do. But yeah. I want to get first reactions from you because that's the most interesting thing that's going on today. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, it's um, the news is obviously unfolding. Like, no one really knows exactly what's happening. It is kind of crazy to me how, uh, I don't know if this speaks to, like, the how young the space still is, right? But, like, yeah. how everything can still ride on, like, a headline, Yeah, you know? And, like, how fast uh, the, like, the narrative can change, mm-hmm. right? So, Yesterday, and I was thinking about this a lot, right? Because we just did our, our earnings call yesterday, and so we're as we're prepping for that, you're writing all this material and expectations and stuff one mm-hmm. way, and then this news comes out, and all of a sudden you get like huge amounts of volatility, and everyone's like, "Oh, but Binance is going to basically bail them out." Right? Yeah, we have kind of this crypto lender of last resort. Um, price starts to stabilize a little bit, and then it starts to leak that actually that was just an LOI. There's nothing binding there. Yeah, you start to see things decline, and then obviously with this morning, it's like we woke up and we're in a totally different world. Yeah, you know. So, um, yeah, I mean, I don't think anyone expected. I mean, if they did, they probably made a good amount of money, but I don't know that most of us <laughs> expect to wake up with like Bitcoin 15 percent down from like where it was, you know, previously. And mm-hmm. when you know, is it for us like when it in the mining space? Um, it certainly raises a lot of questions. It's like certainly too early to tell like how this is going to play out and like impact the industry. Yeah. But with margins already like where they were, it starts to raise a lot of questions, right? Like, yeah, who can stay solvent? Like, if you have debt, like, how's that going to work out? Stuff like that. So it's uh, may you live in interesting times, right? And I think <laughs> we, <laughs> we certainly are living in interesting times today. Great segue, teed me up there. October was rough for miners. Yeah. Argo, Core, Iris. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of private as well. We're seeing possibly beginnings of minor capitulation. Mm-hmm. We'll find out later. Maybe if it's already over, maybe it's yeah. done. There's a lot of miners out there that are not doing so well. Curious to get your take, or Marathon's take, on what's happening in this space right now with minor debt. Uh, I'll leave it there. I'm not going to ask any, anything more like specific, but just like your first takes on what you've been seeing the last few weeks. It's. Uh, I think it's, it's a tough time to be a Bitcoin miner, right? Um, and... I think uh, this this is really like a, you know, people are getting tested right now um, to see, and like the different business models are getting tested. Um, it's amazing to see like how uh, like sentiment has changed from a year ago. You yeah. know, if we think, uh, I mean, a year ago close, we were like near the peak, right, mm-hmm. I think. Um, and at that point it was like grow at all costs, right? Like people didn't care about what mm-hmm. type of miners you were buying, how you were raising capital. It was just like grow, 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 right? Cause like people had these 80% gross margins built into their business. Yeah. Um, and now like that's very different, yeah. right? So, and I, and I also think at the time, like this is also probably a result of the fact that mining at scale is like a completely new thing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if you think back to even early 2020, um, you know, there were, I don't know, just a handful of publicly traded miners. Most of them were, mm-hmm. I mean, Marathon, I like in particular, was what, $7 million market cap, right? Yeah. Like two yeah. and a half years ago or whatever. Um, and I think people kind of lost sight that there's differences in the business models mm-hmm. and how you grow matters because um, it became this arms race and people yeah. got a little caught up in the euphoria. And so now I think what we're seeing is, you know, what, who, you know, you're trying to figure out like who's actually like built a sustainable business model. Yeah. Um, 
And I think a lot of people, we were all testing different things, trying different things. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I think now, like, it's unfortunate, you know, you've seen a lot of companies, like, struggle, which no mm -hmm. one likes to see. I don't think it's great for the industry. Yeah. Um, but it does, you know, it, and it's hopefully the optimist in me. This is, gonna, yeah. this is like a dark <laughs> optimist comment, but, like, maybe there's some creative destruction going on. Yeah. You know, and so we'll see, like, I ideally lessons learned from this, right? And you hope that the companies who do make it out mm -hmm. on the other side are a little bit stronger, more robust, more mature, and that like people who are then looking at these businesses as investment opportunities or building their own mining operations, like take yeah. learning lessons from this as well. So now there's a bunch to comment on that. I won't dig any more deeper into it. Uh, I think at this point, most sentiment is known. I guess maybe one comment on it would be, it is interesting to look at the similarities between some of these lending teams out there mm. and these exchanges, which were just like flipping customers. Money. Yeah. And then looking at the mining space where they were taking you know, debt or they're taking ASIC back loans yeah. or high interest rate loans yeah. and using that to funnel into growth immediately. And yeah. both plays failed. The mining market seems to have more structure in it where when these things are falling apart, you can like claw back ASICs, claw back mm -hmm. facilities. Uh, you can take Bitcoin from people. Mm -hmm. But looking at the other space, lending, exchanges, there's not much you can do like FTX yeah. this morning or going back to like Three Rose Capital, um, looking at Terra Luna, Celsius Voyager, like those customers were just screwed. So, yeah. Yeah, there's an interesting play between those two things. And Well, I think something yeah. people are learning is like what happens when you collateralize yeah. uh, loans with assets that are highly volatile, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that's that's both to, you know, that's that spreads. There's some that are more than others, right? But that yeah. includes tokens, which people have learned very quickly, right? especially yeah. today, like what happens when you do that. Yeah. Um, in the mining space, that's, you know, there are people, ourselves included, have, have some debt that's collateralized with Bitcoin. Yeah. Bitcoin changes in price substantially. What does that do, right? Mm -hmm. Like, how do you work around that? Um, and then same with ASICs, right? Like uh, ASIC pricing is dynamic yeah. and it tracks Bitcoin pricing. It does lag behind it, um, I think by about 30 or 45 days, but yeah. it moves in the same direction. And so, and it's also, you have to do something with those machines, right? If you are, if you do claw back and receive miners, like if you're a lender, mm -hmm. okay, great. Like what do you do with them, yeah. right? Um, for those to be valuable, they have to be plugged in at energy pricing that can actually sustain operating and with these it's funny these numbers are from yesterday and they're already yeah. stale right but yeah. like um <laughs> at least as of like yesterday when bitcoin was 20 percent higher than it is now yeah um you know it was unprofitable to run s9s at three and a half cents a kilowatt hour i think um mm -hmm. s17s at six and a half s or s19s around eight and a half mm -hmm. uh, which was not like far off the industry average yeah. probably for electricity pricing and so, um, you know, yes, you can get back an asset, but that asset needs to be productive. Yeah. And like, is it in today's market? You know, it depends. And it's yeah. it's also like, it's not simple to, um, running a mining operation also isn't a simple endeavor. And yeah. People have learned that as well, right? There's a lot of complexity to it. It's not so easy <laughs> yeah. as, yeah, it's not, right? It's not as easy as just like plug the machine into the wall. Yeah. Um, when you're at when you're talking about tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of servers, mm -hmm. it's a little bit it's mm -hmm. a little more complex. So yeah, and we'll dig into the complexities in a, in a second, especially when we talk about the hosted model. Let's talk about your guys' Q3 numbers, however, and I'm gonna hand it just right back to you since you guys did that yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, and then just have a follow up on that as well, making the Q3 numbers make sense based on what you guys have been going through in 2022. Mm -hmm. Every mining team has a different journey from the last year, or yeah. two years, I should say, really, just like the bull cycle. And you guys have had uh, definitely an interesting one. So some context on these Q3 numbers would be pretty clutch. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, the third quarter in general is basically transition and rebuilding, I think, for Marathon, if you look at it. We, we entered the quarter in a pretty rough spot. Um, I was uh, sort of joking with people that at the time we were a Bitcoin miner that wasn't mining Bitcoin and didn't know when we were going to mine Bitcoin, right? Which is a difficult thing to try to message to the marketplace. Um, at the time, like, you know, we had those delays getting machines on in Texas. So uh, Texas wasn't online. At the same time, we were, you know, we had to transition out of our facility in Montana a little bit sooner. We also got hit with a storm. It was like yeah. this Murphy's Law of like yeah. things going on. Yeah. And, uh, can um, I interject about yeah. that storm? It a, must have been a wicked storm, right? Yes. Like, yeah. Do, do you have any more info about that? I heard only like rumors yeah. about like 
this seemed like an act like an act of God. It was. It felt like it, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. The Bitcoin gods were not in favor of us yeah. at that time. Yeah. Um, it was the same uh, storm that uh, damaged Yellowstone. Okay. So if you remember, like reading yeah. about the flooding and yeah. stuff of like how roads got washed out, people couldn't get into the park, which was like mm-hmm. felt you know apocalyptic almost. Yeah. Um, it was a carryover from that, or okay. it was tied to the same cell. So it was a. Uh, there's a huge amount of wind that went through the area. Mm-hmm. I, my understanding is it was almost like, you know, a tornado or a hurricane had yeah. come up, and so there was a lot of structural damage that occurred. Um, fortunately for us, it wasn't a lot to the data center and to the machines themselves. Yeah, but the power plant um, was damaged in the process, and so as a result of that, the yeah. machines went down. Um, that was we were talking about learning lessons right yeah. a second ago, and like one of the big ones for us was. You need backup power if you're going to run mm-hmm. mining operations. Um, mm-hmm. Marathon's operations in Montana always were intermittent. They yeah. never were at uh, nearly the capacity we expected. And the reason for that was partly uh, due to the, just the way the, that plant operated, mm-hmm. um, partly because we didn't have a grid connection. So yeah. there was no backup power. Yeah. If there was inconsistent power or a huge storm, active mm-hmm. god event, you were just offline, right? So lesson learned there, right? Mm-hmm. You want redundancy in your power if you can get it, um, which we've tried to integrate at new places, including mm-hmm. Texas, which is now coming online, which is great. So yeah. Um, yeah, we. I mean, I think we started the quarter with about 0.7 exahashes of capacity yeah. online, like pretty small from where we were supposed to be. Yeah. Um, and then uh, fortunately, like we got approval to start turning miners on at King Mountain, which is this wind farm out in West Texas. Uh, that pretty much came fully online as of November 1. Mm-hmm. So from uh, what was nice is we finally were able to demonstrate, I think, month over month in the quarter and, su- and subsequent to its end that mm-hmm. our Bitcoin production improved every month. Yeah. Um, so I think we went from like 72 Bitcoin in, uh, what, July to yeah. 184, 300 something, 615 in October. Yeah. So did almost as much Bitcoin in October as we did in all of Q3. Nice. Or one shy, yeah. So some dust in a wallet. You know, <laughs> there we go. Um, so yeah, and I think um, you know, obviously the delays were very frustrating for us and frustrating yep. for everyone who is you know invested in the company or watching it. So, uh, we've learned that not everything is within your control as a mining operation, and mm-hmm. as fast as the Bitcoin world likes to move, sometimes power markets and the regulators don't move quite as yeah. fast. Um, but it's been, you know, in other ways we're fortunate, right? It's like, it's good timing for us to finally be mm-hmm. moving at capacity, bringing miners online, producing, especially given kind of what's going on in broader markets. So yeah. Q3 numbers like don't look great, right? Yeah. Like quarter over quarter or year over year, I mean. Um, but I think if people like look at our production and they understand like where we were at and mm-hmm. where we are now, um, for me, I mean, I know I'm biased, right? I said internally, yeah. but <laughs> I think it tells a nice story of like uh, consistent growth off of yeah. that. So then the question is, well, can you keep doing that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and kind of where do you go from here? So yeah. that's really our focus at this point. Yeah, the contextualization there is nice because you guys have definitely had an interesting journey moving out of Harden, making that very difficult choice. Yeah. And then opening up in Texas, fallout from Compute North's Chapter 11 yeah. filing, which uh, many miners, including Compass, yeah. were involved in and continue to figure out what that's going to look like. Yeah. It's been a lot. One thing is just more that common than a question, just been impressive to see you guys like continue to move forward. Even, you know, at the beginning, you guys weren't really mining in July. That, yeah. I heard no, that we joke weren't. going around yeah. as well. Like, Marathon Digital, the, the mining team that doesn't that mine. That doesn't mine, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that's how it was, but you sucked the vision, and now you guys got 600-plus Bitcoin last month. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I like the the point you're just making about, like, where does it go from here? And look at the numbers. You guys have 7 x hash online, and you're looking to get, I think, to 9 x hash by the end of the year. Mm-hmm. And then 2023, the, I think the forecast was 23 x hash. Mm-hmm. Um so on based on those numbers, be curious to know about why you guys downgraded to nine exahash. I yeah. think previously it was eleven or twelve. Correct me if I'm wrong. Mm-hmm. So why did you guys degrade? And then a follow-up question on that. Yeah. Do you think the forecasting actually helps, or is that only just because of public markets? That's all they really know how to yeah. understand. I've talked with a few miners about this who are public, and they've all said like we have to do it. We don't like doing the forecasts. Yeah. Like, to your point, you said earlier, 
it's impossible to know what's going to happen. Like mm -hmm. a freak storm comes in and hits hard and shuts down a lot of guys' operations. Yeah. It's it's almost unfair to put a forecast out there, but mm -hmm. at the same time, I just don't know if retail investors and Bitcoin mining companies have any other metrics that they're familiar with or comfortable yeah. using. Well, let's unpack it around like philosophy of messaging and stuff, right? And public markets and internal like expectations versus external expectations, right? It's always a challenge. Yeah. Um, and, you know, people always want more transparency. I yeah. think the Bitcoin mining industry is really unique among public companies um, mm -hmm. because everything's on a blockchain, right? And for us, like, because we run our own pool, yeah, uh, you can see our revenue every single day, yeah. which is unheard of for a yeah. public company, right? It's pretty cool, though. It is cool, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, it, it, it can be a little bit of a headache, you know, like yeah. if we have a down day or an unlucky day, I start getting calls of like, hey, why, are you, why aren't you producing Bitcoin? And it's like, well, it's, you know, it's luck, right? Sometimes it yeah. spreads out. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that level of transparency is great. I think it in theory means that like people should really know the numbers as they're coming mm -hmm. out, right? Like, and the fact that we all publish like pr reports on a monthly basis, yeah. I think also helps. Um, the but you know people always want more, mm -hmm. right? Um, mm -hmm. I think more like institutional investors. I think understand that sometimes expectations can move. Yeah. So you're asking about like our projections, right? So we were I think we a couple weeks ago we thought we'd be at eleven five end of the year. Now we're saying nine. The twenty three hasn't moved, so we're still contracted for twenty three exahash by roughly yeah. mid next year. Um, but a lot that mostly has just to do with like construction mm -hmm. employment schedules. And so, you know, if something moves, we're talking about, you know, basically building facilities that are housing tens of thousands of servers, yeah. right? It's a fairly complex process. And you're trying to target construction schedules like to the day, yeah, right? And so if something moves, I mean, in public markets, if something moves by a day, it can be out and pushed into the next quarter, yeah. right? So that can have like a huge impact. Um, so for us, like any of the variance tends to come from construction schedules mm -hmm. moving 30 to 60 days, one day or the other, or one direction yeah. or the other. So sometimes they can be pulled forward, sometimes they can be pushed out. Um, so that's part of it. We do try to always like update people mm -hmm. with those as they're changing and as we get new information. Because, you know, our data for the most part is as good as what our hosting providers can feed to yeah. us, right? Because we, we work with other people, we outsource what we do. Um, so we rely pretty heavily on them for setting those expectations. And then we do try to build in as, mu as much of a buffer as we can. Um, you know, for any company, your internal projections should be more aggressive than your external ones, yeah. right? Ideally, you're, uh, you're setting expectations, you beat them by like 10%. Yeah. That's like the perfect number. Yeah. Um, and you do that consistently. Um, but that can just be hard to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, to your point, there can be a lot within the space that's outside of your direct control. Yeah. Um, can be energization delays, we learned that, right? Um, there can be construct changes to construction schedules, we've learned that. Weather can be an issue, we've mm -hmm. learned that. Um, so I think, yeah, we try to, we just try to keep people as updated as we can. Mm -hmm. And um, I, it would, would it be nice if you didn't have to put out any projections? Certainly, right? Yeah. Like you have less scrutiny. Um, but then you would probably lose the advantage of being public. Right, mm -hmm. and the only real advantage of being public is access to capital. And if you're mm -hmm. going to do that, and if you're going to have many owners of your business, those people all deserve access to information. Yeah. And so, you want to make sure that you're sharing like the appropriate amount of that if yeah. you can. But yeah, setting expectations is really difficult. We yeah. uh, we certainly have not been perfect in that. I think we do as well as we can. But I think we we try as much as we can to reiterate that like mm -hmm. these are. Um, you know, it's not necessarily guidance. It's just like, here's what we know based on the world. Yeah. And we happen to live in a space that the world can change very quickly. Yeah. So when that happens, then we try to update those accordingly. Gotcha. Two things you brought up I want to circle back on. I wasn't planning yeah. on asking about them, but they're both interesting. One, the Harden site. So you guys yeah. made that announcement in April, I believe, that you're pulling out of Harden, mm -hmm. mostly around ESG concerns. Mm -hmm. you know, it's a coal-based plan that was brought back to life. I forget the energy firm behind it, but that decision was more or less to appease public markets and also your guys' job as fiduciary, like mm -hmm. to your shareholders. Reflections on that at this point, having moved out, having to deal with Compute North, yeah. having to deal with so much you know, offline time. How do you guys look back on that decision and going forward with that decision? Yeah. Is it something that you guys are like 
proud of for making that decision or is it something like that could have been handled better? What's the fallout from it? Um, I mean, I think it was yeah, it's definitely the right call for us. Um, it was, so I think it speaks to that choice and like the history of Hardin. I actually think it's like an interesting case study for how the mining opera entire industry has evolved. So we contracted to move into Hardin a little over almost exactly two years ago. It was like Q, end of Q3, Q4 of 2020. And at the time, the name of the game was just go find stranded energy and that's your cheapest source of power. And the, in a lot of cases, those were stranded coal plants or fossil fuel plants, right? Um, large renewable energy companies had no interest in Bitcoin mining. Um, we you know, tried to get them interested. They weren't at the time. I know this also anecdotally. I have a friend who was working at Exelon and he was trying for months to get them to look at Bitcoin mining and attaching it to their nuclear sites that were underutilized. And he was just getting laughed out of the room, right? So like, it wasn't on anyone's radar. Um, the industry was real enterprise, enterprise, you know, or large public Bitcoin mining wasn't a thing. So you kind of had to go just where you could. Um, a year, fast forward a year later, like end of 2021, that's completely different. Um, and I'm not, I don't think this is purely because of us, but, you know, Fred, our CEO, did spend a lot of time going around talking about this idea that there's this potentially brilliant synergistic relationship between renewable power and Bitcoin mining because renewables are intermittent. Uh, they get curtailed before anything else. Uh, if you think about like the, the power stack, uh, where like nuclear and coal's base load, renewables sit at the top. Um, and so therefore renewable power companies should partner with Bitcoin miners. Um, and then we started to do that. Um, so people now know it's Nextera Energy out in West Texas. It's the King Mountain wind site. Uh, that's a wind farm that was built 20 years ago. It is, it, uh, was struggling to operate profitably. They had issues selling the energy back to the grid um, due to the fact that it's very isolated and there's not much out there. It's like an hour outside of Odessa, Texas. Nice. So, uh, <laughs> super exciting Fun place to go visit. There. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah for, uh, high school football, that's about it. That's yeah. all that's out there. Yeah. And pony pumps. Um, and uh, there's grid congestion. There's just like not a lot of transmission lines. So mm -hmm. that was this that became sort of this first use case or like case study of, you know, a Bitcoin miner going behind the meter off grid to a renewable site and trying to like basically make it more profitable, yeah. utilizing wasted energy. Mm -hmm. um, we obviously had complications with doing that, right? That was not an easy thing to get done, but um, it was, we kind of view that as like an evolution of the industry mm -hmm. and an evolution of our business model. So as we yeah. started to look more towards that as other deployment options became available, we felt it was like the right time to move out of the yeah. coal-fired power plant. So move off of that, try to move more towards renewable sources if we can. Um, and there's others we're looking at too, which uh, we can talk about if you're curious. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, so yes, there was like this ESG perspective to it. And that mm -hmm. is really important um, for us, like ethically, we wanna, I don't think any of us really have an interest in turning on stranded fossil fuel plants. Yeah. Um, but it was also a very practical decision, right? Um, and it's also not a secret that that plant never operated at high capacity. If you yeah. go back and look at our Bitcoin production, you see all the variance month to month. Yeah. Like that was, that was that plant's operations, right? So um, it was about improving, um, becoming more sustainable, um, mm -hmm. as well as becoming more operationally effective. And, um, you know, was the timing perfect? No, but it like maybe 30 days later would have been nicer, but yeah. a storm hit, right? Yeah. And so it kind of accelerated how fast we moved out of there. Yeah, can't, uh, can't stop the weather. Okay, second question, <laughs> Mara Pool. Yeah. Mara Pool is interesting for a few reasons. One, the OFAC stuff, which I'll get to in a second, the history of it, got to talk about, of course. Yeah. Two, the fact that you guys use your own pool after we've seen a few public miners try to do it over this last year and yeah. it didn't, go super well for them because of the luck that you mentioned earlier. Yeah. Uh, you guys really haven't had that issue because you guys have enough hash rate online mm -hmm. and over the projections will be even larger. So be pretty big. Luck won't really be a problem uh, as I foresee it. To the OFAC point though, curious to get your thoughts on it 18 months later. Yeah. Because of the tornado cash stuff, because yeah. of what's been happening with, with Ethereum right now. Yeah. I've seen so many other people start lobbing those comments and those barbs back towards Marathon and you know it's been a while since that happened right yeah. and then you guys turned it off not using it anymore at the same time like I don't think people appreciate how much pressure is on 
public listed Bitcoin miners mm-hmm. to comply with the U.S. government. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was just talking with Damien, our podcast producer, about that yesterday. Yeah, it's likely inevitable that it's coming to everyone in crypto at some point, and I think that the hardline Bitcoin maximalists out there just don't have an appreciation for that. Mm. Uh, but I'll leave it to you if this kind of gave a little ramble there. But yeah. Your thoughts on it like 18 months later or so. Many thoughts on yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess I'll start by saying, um, you know, we're U.S. publicly traded company. Yeah. Operations are based in the United States. If that ever were to get uh, mandated by regulators, right, that you have to do this, like we would, of course, abide by it and follow yeah. it, right? And I think everyone in the industry would have to. Um, however, because we tried doing this, and I can walk through the history, actually, if you want. Mm-hmm. I don't know if, if you're familiar with it um, and, like, why we tried to do yeah. it. Um, we also learned a lot, uh, mostly that it's not a good idea. Um, there's two reasons for it. One is sort of social, like people hated it. Yeah. Right? I mean, 18 yeah. months later, you just got brought up. Right? Yeah. Um, it's this like black mark on Marathon. Mm-hmm. Um, and for good reason, right? They thought it was us trying to like change Bitcoin, filter mm-hmm. Bitcoin, um, which I think was a little bit of a misnomer, but I know it's a sensitive topic and I know why, yeah. like I get it. Um, philosophically, like why people would be opposed to that. Um, but it also, it doesn't work, yeah. is like the more important piece. So if, and this is this goes towards like Bitcoin's fungibility, which yeah. is maybe like what people had the bigger issue with, like less yeah. the screening, because those transactions still get processed by other miners, just mm-hmm. not by us. But I think there was this fear that it would be a threat to Bitcoin's fungibility. And today I actually hear less about the OFAC Mm-hmm. Uh, topic more about people trying to create green Bitcoin. Yeah, that's become a trendy thing. Yeah, um, our stance is like that's not a good idea and not technically feasible. Yeah. So if you let's say you were to create OFAC or green Bitcoin, mm-hmm. meaning like your processes, you screen. Let's just use the OFAC one, I guess, to start. Yeah. So let's say like we could effectively screen for wallets that were on the OFAC list. We could filter those out. Um, then every Bitcoin we produce, let's we're claiming is OFAC compliant, right? Um, that actually didn't work for us. People were like dusting our wallets with mm-hmm. things. So um, uh, we actually had issues there. But that Bitcoin, you can put a stamp on it as OFAC compliant only as long as it never moves. Yeah. Which is the thing, right? So like as soon as you were to transfer it, mm-hmm. all of a sudden it's now just regular Bitcoin. Yeah. It's tainted. Um, because like the way because of the way you do transactions, right? Like you send someone your entire mm-hmm. Bitcoin, you receive change, so all of it now moves. There's no serial number tied to a Bitcoin. Yeah. So it just it will remain OFAC compliant, if you would, as long as it doesn't change wallets. Yeah. But that's highly impractical. Mm-hmm. Um, the so for that reason, and the same for the green Bitcoin. That's another reason I don't think that makes any sense. Yeah. Um, the other reason the green Bitcoin doesn't make sense, which is this is a little bit of an aside, is like why would you ever need it? Yeah. The only reason you need it is if you think Bitcoin mining itself is a super dirty industry and you can differentiate, Mm -hmm. right? But um, the industry is clearly becoming more sustainably powered. Um, There actually are no scope one emissions because it's just Mm -hmm. a data center, right? And then if you go down the list and you want to look at what kind of power you use, um, you know, if you if you have the Bitcoin Mining Council's data on one side, right, and 65% sustainable, yeah. you have Cambridge Analytica on the other, which, you know, has maybe yeah. the opposite bias <laughs> of the Bitcoin Mining Council. They're, even they are, what, I think 37%. Yeah, that's pretty high. So, so like, you're somewhere in that range, right? Yeah. Um, and you went from highly fossil fuel dependent, companies like early marathon days, right, mm-hmm. just fossil fuel, to now mostly uh, sustainable power. Yeah. So I think if you prove that to people, then there's actually no demand for the green Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, we also found that with the OFAC Bitcoin, um, part of the reason we tried to do it was mm-hmm. in early 2020, when we were going to speak to institutional investors, like the feedback we got, because there was no interest at the time. Yeah. And I remember when I was first answering questions, trying to educate like Wall Street analysts and investors mm-hmm. on Bitcoin, you know, they were like, so where do you guys keep your picks and shovels? Like, how do you <laughs> dig for the Bitcoin? How deep is it in the earth? You know, it was just like silly questions because um, <laughs> people didn't know, right? Yeah. Um, and th- and so because of like the lack of education, there was this belief that, well, Bitcoin's just used by criminals. Yeah. Um, so we as an institution can't touch it, but hey, we'd be interested if you had clean OFAC Bitcoins. Mm-hmm. So that's where the the initiative came from was, well, let's see if we can build it, right? Yeah. Um, 
interestingly, not only was it not technically feasible for the reasons we already talked about, but um, when we went back to those investors and we were like, hey, we've got OFAC Bitcoin, how much more mm-hmm. would you pay for it? They said, oh, we're not going to pay any more for it. Oh. So there was actually yeah. no demand for it either. Yeah. Um, and I so I and I think the same with the green Bitcoin argument. Like yeah. I don't think it technically works. I don't think there's a market for it. Um, I mean, good on people if they want to go try and find yeah. out. But uh, one of the nice things about us having tried is I think we've got some good data points to yeah. point towards where we you know sit mm-hmm. on the matter today. So. Yeah, it's a holistic answer. I hope uh, people listen to it on Twitter because it's. <laughs> Yeah, like to your point, 18 months later, we're still talking about it. And I think it's because it'll always be sort of a benchmark moment yeah. in OFAC history with Bitcoin yeah. and crypto writ large. Just like we saw with Tornado Cash in August and the developer in the Netherlands being arrested. Those are probably, those are watershed moments, honestly. Yeah. Um, but there's yeah. also like, you know, I, I also don't think it's really high on regulators' priorities yeah. list, you know? Um, at least not the people that I've spoken to. Yeah, I, I mean they have other things to worry about, right? Like the exchanges are yeah. now an important thing, right? <laughs> Stable. I wish they were a little earlier. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and if like, and if it's really important, mm-hmm. like uh, if the OFAC thing is that important, like you just control the on and off ramps, yeah. right? And those are the exchanges. You don't need to go to like the base layer of processing yeah. transactions and stuff. Okay, we'll leave the OFAC questions aside for now and move to another hot topic. The hosted model for Bitcoin yeah. mining, which, as an aside, you know, Compass Mining, which uh, runs this podcast, definitely has a hosting first model. And yeah. it's been difficult for a lot of reasons that Marathon has also experienced. You have contract, that contractor puts that contract into other contractors' mm-hmm. hands, trying to build out sites, supply chain issues, um, there's failures to get things online in time. So there's a whole bunch of issues with it. The other side, though, of course, is building your own site. And that is expensive. The vertical vertical integration with it is, that takes a lot of time as well. Um, so I haven't actually heard, heard a clear answer on which one is better. Mm. I think, to your point that you said earlier in the conversation, we're still trying to find out. Like, yeah. The last two years has been a lot of experimentation on what mining, uh, enterprise mining looks like. Mm-hmm. But going to boot it over to you, get your thoughts on the hosted model. Yeah. Maybe you can walk through some of the examples of the things that you guys have faced. And then I'd love to hear some thoughts on like what the next year looks like, given that you guys still have the same projected exit hash online for 2023. Yeah. Yeah, we, we obviously have a little bit of a different uh, perspective on the hosted model from everyone mm-hmm. else because we don't do it, right? That's like, mm-hmm. that was our big differentiator. You know, mm-hmm. uh, the s- phrase we used to use was investing in, assets that generate revenue yeah. as opposed to ones that don't. Um, yeah. So miners, not data centers. Yeah. Um, the And that may change over time, right? I think there's maybe some mix where like owning some infrastructure long-term makes sense. Yeah. Um, we kind of felt that it was it was early in the process to try to like own and build data centers. Um, the technology is changing really quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you're going to switch from air-cooled to immersion, that requires a redesign. Yeah. Um, and so the data center probably has a five-year lifespan, not a 20. So that was one of the reasons that we didn't really mm-hmm. want to go into it. Um, as it relates to like just hosting in general, though, like one thing Fred talks about is looking at where the value is created mm-hmm. uh, among the different businesses. So, or the different, like the, what they're bringing to the table. Yeah. And there's really too large value creation Mm -hmm. uh, or too large value streams involved in Bitcoin mining. There's the hardware, which like allows you to connect and produce Bitcoin. And then there's energy. Mm -hmm. Um, The old school, uh, old school, right? Uh, This industry is what, a year old? Yeah. Um, (laughs) (laughs) The like, what people have done so far, the, the original hosting model was to sit in between those two variables. Mm -hmm. And I think what we've seen in the market of late is that long-term, well, that becomes commoditized very quickly. Yeah. um, And it also introduces quite a bit of risk. Yeah. uh, Unless you have done a very good job hedging your energy pricing. Mm -hmm. Um, Personally, I think it makes more sense for the power provider to also be the hosting company. Mm -hmm. And we've been talking about that for over a year now. Um, And the reason is that they own the single biggest input cost, right? Mm -hmm. They own the power. Um, If you're just a pure hosting company, um, you know, the value you're providing is sort of just the service of like 
cleaning the miners, right? Yeah. Operating them, making sure that they maintain uptime. But you're trying to generate margin in between an industry that's very margin compressed and yeah. in between two players, neither of which like you necessarily control. So I think it's challenging to do that. Um, so I, I kind of see this evolving where maybe you have, we're actually, it's, it's sort of an evolution of what we started to do in West Texas, mm -hmm. uh, King Mountain, where you have Bitcoin miners joint venture directly with power providers. And the power providers will probably spend most of the CapEx to build out the hosting facility. Yeah. Um, and maybe the miner contributes some CapEx to that, or maybe they contribute something else in kind, like machines yeah. to the joint venture. And then you do like a rev share off of that yeah. um, or a profit share off of that. For me, that makes more sense. I mean, building data centers is energy or is capital intensive. Um, energy companies have way deeper pockets than most people. They have very cheap access to capital. Yeah. Um, and they're going to want a tenant at their site for a long period of time. So it just makes sense for them to own the infrastructure and then shop around to tenants to come populate it. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of like my take. It also, in that sense too, like you have opportunity to be off or behind the meter mm -hmm. in most instances, which I think is just generally better, um, both for grids as well as for um, consumers and for the, the mining operators as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think if you're on grid, it can present some challenges. Uh, you have a lot of fluctuating power pricing. You have to like maybe make this argument that you're not parasitic load, right? Because then it is a little zero sum. You're kind of yeah. pulling energy that could go elsewhere. If you're behind the meter, you're not taking energy that's going some, that could have gone somewhere else. Yeah. Um, so I think that might be how this ends up evolving is just over time, the power companies become the hosts as well. Yeah. Um, or not actually operating it. Like they'll pay to build the data center and then they'll find someone who's a great operator to come in yeah. and just like provide the service of managing the machines themselves. Two follow-ups on that. Yeah. The hosting model opens you up to multiple risks. The, the two biggest, I think, is one ASIC prices. Mm. Like, you know, they're just going up and down yeah. just like everything else. Yeah. And then two, counterparty risk with, you know, what we've seen with Compute North or others, yeah. you know, they didn't have their ducks in a row. Yeah. And the person who has to eat that is the person who signed the hosting lease to, yeah. to, to move into it. And then all of a sudden you can't move into it. Yeah. Now you have this depreciating asset that's yeah. not mining Bitcoin. How are you guys thinking about that now, those two, those two risks? I saw that you guys flipping a lot of your ASICs into S19XPs. Mm -hmm. So that's one mm -hmm. benefit, obviously. Uh, but yeah, I'll leave it to you, those two things, the ASIC risk and then yeah. the counterparty risk from hosting. I guess I'll, I'll do them in kind of reverse order. So yeah. counterparty risk from hosting, um, we, yeah, we've learned some lessons from that as well. Yeah. Um, the, I think it's important if you're, so stay tuned, like working directly with power companies is something we like to do, we're interested yeah. in. Uh, that was like, again, this test in West Texas. Um, we'll see if there's other places we might be able to do that in the future. As it relates to current operations, our next big expansion or the stuff that's going on now is with applied blockchain yeah. um, in Texas and then in North Dakota. Um, and my and my understanding is that they've hedged the, all of their energy. So yeah. um, where the where hosts have gotten in trouble so far is they had fixed pricing of energy for their customers and then variable pricing. And if they didn't hedge that energy mm -hmm. appropriately, then suddenly they found themselves underwater. Yeah. Um, so we feel pretty good about how Applied's managed the energy yeah. uh, hedging, um, but that's certainly an important thing to like consider. I think when you're looking at this. Yeah. Um, as it relates to ASIC pricing, um, yeah, the machine pricing is dynamic. We've been fortunately for us, it's dynamic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, because we bought uh, man, how many? Um, 70,000 and then another 30,000, so 100,000 XPs mm -hmm. in the last year. Um, you know, at the time in December when we bought, I think, 70,000, we paid basically top of market price, yeah. uh, but we had price protection built into that. So as the uh, market value of ASICs has come down with Bitcoin price coming down, we've been benefiting from that, yeah. which has given us- Can you explain the price protection really yeah. quickly? Um, so it's a little complicated, uh, but when you sign the agreements, uh, the price of the machine is not the final price. Mm -hmm. It's an estimate based on the current market conditions. Yeah. And then basically what happens is a month before the machines are shipped, uh, we not literally, but maybe like hop on a call with Bitmain, mm -hmm. talk about what's going on in the market. 
um, look at what the fair market rate for that machine would be given the price of Bitcoin, yeah. and then the price is established off that point. So, you know, when we were buying these, we paid about eighty dollars a terahash for the XP yeah. originally, or that was what was in the contract. Today, I think the XP is in the low thirties mm-hmm. yeah. per terahash. So that means that's actually the price that we're paying for the yeah. machine. And because we've paid deposits up front, it means that our capital requirements for the rest of receiving those units is mm-hmm. much lower than anticipated. Mm-hmm. Um, so we've benefited a lot from that as a company, which has been great for us. Yeah. Um, so that's, yeah, I mean, that's kind of how the price protection functions. Um, yeah. The the reason it's like really important, we think it's really important that we have those. Um, you always want to be deploying the latest and greatest tech. Mm-hmm. Um, for the XPs in particular, I mean, we bought so many that by the time we get fully deployed about mid next year, assuming we hit our targets, yeah. right? always an assumption, Yeah. Um, about 66% of our hash rate should be coming from S19 XPs, okay. uh, which is a lot. Yeah. Um, why does that matter? Like, what does that mean in real people terms? Um, the XP is 30% more efficient mm-hmm. than the S19, than the prior generation. Um, we've sort of run the math, and it looks like with the number of XPs we'll have, our average fleet will be operating at 24.2, I think, joules per terahash. Mm-hmm. And I think the average and for all of Bitcoin mining today is about 47 or 45 yeah. joules per terahash. Um, so if you can operate with less energy, less input cost, that mm-hmm. means you can keep the lights on longer than other people, Yeah, um, which is hugely important given what's been going on with Bitcoin's price the last couple of days, mm-hmm. as well as with growing hash rate. Um, and since Bitcoin mining is basically a zero-sum game <laughs> where the pricing is... Uh, mm-hmm. um, uh, or the the difficulty rates dynamic, yeah. Um, you know, and that means that you have more upside in bull markets uh, mm-hmm. because basically you're producing more. You have more hash rate online, right? Yeah. And in bear markets, it means you have more downside protection because if you can stay on when other people can't, hash rate comes down, difficulty rate comes down. Now you're producing more BTC. Yeah. Um, so it kind of self corrects, right? Um, so it's. It's interesting how like the emotional reaction to the XP yeah. purchase has changed over time. Yeah. Because when we did it, it was like, oh, Marathon does another big order, like yeah. exciting, grow, 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 right? That was, and then, you know, uh, equity markets came down, Bitcoin prices came down, uh, machine pricing came down. Everyone's mm-hmm. like, oh, these guys were idiots. They bought at the height, right? <laughs> like, how are they going to pay for these things? Um, price protection kicked in. Uh, we started bringing machines online, people stabilize, or, you know, that stabilize a little bit. I yeah. think as people start to digest how important it is to have the efficiency over the next yeah. few months, um, I think that might start to resonate. But I don't know that people really quite get that yet. Yeah, I, I think there's some gaps missing between retail investors and mining equities and the actual industry. Yeah, well, I think it's a large gap, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, one counterpoint or follow-up I want to make is the efficiency gains you make on XPs. Mm-hmm. Are those eaten away by being up the stack on a hosted contract? Mm. Does that counter set what you guys are trying to do by saving? It can. Um, one of the ways we looked at it was um, as uh, electricity and hosting rates were increasing, Yeah. Um, if we could deploy XPs at those locations that maybe have higher energy pricing, it pulls our average back down. Okay. So, which is another, which is like, not that both of those things occur at the same time. It's just yeah. another way of evaluating it, right? So um, we used, like, back in the day, our rates used to be about four and a half cents per kilowatt hour. That was our mm-hmm. blended rate. Um, new contracts were higher than that. But if we can deploy the XPs in those areas where we have higher energy pricing, maybe we can pull ourselves back down closer to that original gotcha. range. So it's, uh, yeah, when we look to deploy them, we're intentionally trying to deploy them at sites that might have higher energy costs than yeah. others uh, because we want to keep our average rate lower. It's more flexible, that's for sure. That yeah. Makes sense because I don't think a lot of people think about how these mining operations have multiple locations with multiple different rates. Yeah. Um, yeah. But we can leave that part there. Let's talk about financing, which you just hinted at. You guys have made some really interesting financing moves, and I've always sort of praised you guys for making a masterstroke. November of 2021, where you guys mm. went to market, $500 million. 
for senior nodes. And then you also followed up with a revolving credit line, which I think you guys re-upped in August for $100 million from Silvergate. So different. One has like a much lower interest rate than the others. We don't have to get too specific into it. Yeah. The question, however, for a lot of people is that $100 million line with a variable interest rate. Yeah. Where does that put you guys at? I don't even know if you guys have deployed it, to be honest, if you've deployed that capital. But like, yeah, where do, where do the books look like for Marathon, given what we've seen the last few weeks? Everyone's so concerned about public miners. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we talked a little bit about it on our earnings call um, yesterday. So we have a line of credit and we have a term loan. Um, and uh, we can basically pull on either one of those or just mm -hmm. levers that we have to use. Um, which is a nice flexibility. And then they're collateralized with Bitcoin. They're backed by Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. um, so we use those as uh, like, I mean, they're nice levers for us to have if we need to move quickly and kind of use capital quickly. Yeah. Um, obviously, people like to see that as opposed to just using uh, equity, right? Yeah. It's nice to have other levers at hand. Um, but we basically just view it as a, as a source of cash. Um, where exactly we stand as of the end of the quarter, I think we talked about um, paying off one and basically moving all of the uh, all that we'd drawn down onto the other. To be honest, I don't recall if it was moving term loan to revolver or mm -hmm. revolver to term loan. I'd have to go back and listen yeah. to our CFO. That's why I'm not the CFO. <laughs> <laughs> There's many other reasons I'm yeah, not the CFO. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I think we'll we'll probably have more details than that in our 10Q when it comes mm -hmm. out. I just don't think it's out yet. Yeah. So that's an reason basically to keep the hodl right you guys have yeah i think the largest hodl of any remaining miner hut eight has a yeah. large one too forget which one of you guys has the larger one but yeah we're uh we're eleven thousand three hundred ish i think mm -hmm. um so i think that puts us in second place among publicly traded miners yeah um, michael saylor is sitting in a pretty comfortable first place he position is. about 10 times more yeah. bitcoin than we have <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, we, we look to add to that. Um, the holdings helps because, and that was one of the reasons that we started doing the term loans. Yeah. Um, when our new CFO came in, we started putting those in place. It was like, you can either sell your Bitcoin mm -hmm. or you can hold on to it, use it as collateral, um, get cash. And then by doing that, you also can benefit from the upside, right? Yeah. Um, if you sell the Bitcoin, you no longer can benefit from the upside, right? You lose that mm -hmm. optionality. And most of what we do is trying to in, is tr is about trying to increase optionality in, yeah. in the business. So we thought by holding it, doing uh, lines of credit or a term loan, that mm -hmm. gave us more flexibility. Um, but yeah, I mean, we we have to watch like how it's collateralized, especially with right now, right with Bitcoin's yeah. price moving around. Um, it is also we also wanted to make sure that we weren't pulling on it too much at a time when we weren't producing a lot of Bitcoin. Yeah. So the more, uh, as production ramps, like the more Bitcoin we produce on a monthly basis, the more we can dedicate to collateral. Like that's why one of the reasons it's good to increase holdings. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, we can sell some if we want to pay for operating expenses otherwise, yeah. but it's, it's the war chest that Bitcoin gives you flexibility. That's yeah. how we look at it. Yeah, that model is interesting. And I've had a few conversations with miners about how they've deployed their HODL. And oddly enough, maybe not oddly, who knows? Uh, the miners who sold their Bitcoin consistently over the last two years are the highest performers in terms of like yeah. exahash mine, um, exahash online stuff like that. Yeah. So like Bitfarms, Iris, Hive, a um, few others, they they always sell, they always sell yeah. their Bitcoin, and they they do really well. That doesn't mean there's not a causality between them necessarily, but it is interesting to see that happen. Well, we also ran an analysis. Um, Fred gave this at a presentation maybe back in August, mm -hmm. um, but where we kind of looked back a little bit and we said, let's take three scenarios. Let's, let's run a scenario where a miner sells 100% of their Bitcoin, yeah. a miner holds 100% of their Bitcoin, and then a miner sells 50%, yeah. um, converts to cash, right? So half cash, like half BTC. And shockingly, uh, holding all of your Bitcoin was the worst strategy. Really? Yeah, the worst return from doing that. Huh. Um, if you sold all of it, that was the second best strategy. Mm -hmm. The best strategy involves some sort of a mix of yeah. holding some and selling some. Um, we just pick 50% arbitrarily. I yeah. don't think that's like the ideal number, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but what that kind of indicated to us was like for treasury management, like there is some perfect world here of a mix of holding Bitcoin and selling Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't sold any, but you also have to take into account like public perception of that, right? Yeah. I think. And especially now, like so far, the miners who have sold, they've 
sort of been forced to. Yeah. Right? They've had to. And so I think there's a little bit of a negative perception around that, not just because it's like, oh, you're not a believer anymore, right? Yeah. You're selling your Bitcoin, yeah. but it's also like, oh, you really need the liquidity. Um, so if you can hold on to it um, and if you can find other ways to generate cash, lines of credit, mm-hmm. term loans, um, then I think that can send a pretty strong signal to people. But interestingly, there does seem to be this mix of actually holding and selling that's optimal. Yeah. Um, and look, it makes sense, right? Like we, the world doesn't quite operate on a Bitcoin standard yet. Yeah. And so at the end of the day, we have to pay for things in cash. Mm-hmm. So there's probably some optimal level there of like Bitcoin holdings and cash holdings that you want. Yeah. Um, I don't know what the perfect mix is, but um, mm-hmm. yeah, it's interesting that like the pure HODL isn't ideal, even though yeah. it sounds good, you know? I don't think it was ever ideal. I mean, I, I think if you could sell Bitcoin for 70K or hold it yeah. all the way to the ground, in your mining operation, which is supposed to be very lean yeah. on purpose, like that's even in the white paper about how, like you're not going to make a lot of money doing this because you're always going to run to that cost. Yeah. Um, so if that's my personal take on it. I think it was a lot of marketing for a lot of Bitcoin miners. It was, and yeah. for good reason, right? Yeah. They, it helps their share price out. Yeah. But now, well, eighteen months well, later. Well, and also the theory at the time was like you're a proxy for Bitcoin, right? Yeah. It was like people don't have an easy way to own Bitcoin. Yeah. Investors don't have easy exposure to it. Yeah. And so the way you got exposure was by buying a mining stock. I yeah. think that narrative is a lot less strong today than it used to be. Yeah. Um, but yeah, to your point about it not being an optimal strategy, I mean, that's where it came from, right? Yeah. That's like my one of my favorite posts on the internet. Yeah. It's like the original HODL post. Yeah. Of, you know, this guy being like, yeah, I'd buy it every uh, <laughs> low and sell it every high, but I'm a bad trader and I know I'm a bad trader. So I just hodl, yeah. right? Um, yeah. So yeah, I don't think it was ever a super sophisticated treasury management mm-hmm. uh, strategy, I think. Uh, and I, I think people get that now and I think public companies are maturing as well, mm-hmm. right? And we're mm-hmm. hopefully getting a little more sophisticated. Totally. Okay, last question for you as we wrap up here. Bear market play is becoming more and more important right mm-hmm. now. Curious to get your thoughts if you guys have like modeled anything, any strategies going to a prolonged bear market. And yeah. the reason obviously is like not only tech layoffs happening, like I think Meta this morning announced 1,300, 1,100 people yeah. getting laid off. Twitter layoffs, crypto layoffs, FTX, all that stuff. That's yeah. bad. Yeah. But then interest rates are also going up. Bitcoin's down. What does a bear market play look like for Marathon? That means it can be successful going to the next bull market or where you got that on that uh, that picture? You know, the phrase people love to throw around is bear markets are great times to build. Mm-hmm. Um, it's true, but you have to be able to build. Yeah. Um, and not everybody can. Um, we're, I mean, people wise, like we're actually adding to the team. We've mm-hmm. stayed really lean. Um, kind of always surprises people, but we're 21 full-time employees right now. Yeah. Um, I mean, a year ago we were uh, I don't know, seven. I yeah. Think. Um, wow. So, and that, that comes from that asset light thing, right? Like we didn't want like huge overhead. We didn't want to be burdened with mm-hmm. that. So I like, I don't think we have any concerns like headcount wise and stuff. Um, and then I think, and, but you know, more importantly, like just in operating, making sure the business stays solvent. I think it's, everything is about like increasing hash rate for us and doing so efficiently. Yeah. Um, that's always been the name of the game, right? That's always true. It's interesting, like the strategy is the same and it should actually be the same in a bull market and a bear market. Yeah. It's just, you don't, you, what you want to do is knock it over your skis in a bull market mm-hmm. um, because you always want to grow your hash rate as efficiently as possible. Yeah. The reason for that is in a bull market, it means you have higher margin, Yeah, which you also need in a bear market, right? Mm-hmm. So um, I, I've never ascribed to the idea of like, just build at any cost. Mm-hmm. Um, because at some point it can turn on you. Yeah. Um, so for us, you know, really, I think in hindsight, the purchase of the XPs is going to look really good for Marathon. Mm-hmm. Um, I think being able to operate so much more efficiently than the rest of the industry is going to be really good. Yeah. Um, it's for us, it's really just a matter of making sure that we can execute, um, and then once and prove to people that we can get to twenty three x a hash, right? Which we've been saying for a yeah. while now. So yeah. I think there's a lot of still kind of wait and see and prove it to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and then once we do that, uh, it's going to be pushing stuff forward, which uh, we're really excited about. Um, yeah. We think international markets are looking really interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, there be due to immersion, um, where you no longer necessarily, if you do it correctly, have to worry about like heat. Yeah. Um, and dust. There are parts of the world where there are massive asymmetries in how much uh, 
electricity or power they consume in different times of the year. Yeah. Um, summer months, they use a lot. Eight, nine months of the year, they don't. And so there are places like that that suddenly look great for Bitcoin mining, mm -hmm. which are interesting to us. And then uh, if we look more towards North America, there are, immersion also opens this up, but there are ways in which you can probably do get away from this large scale, like 200 megawatt size deployment yeah. and do lots of small deployments because you don't have to do as much maintenance on the miners. Oh, interesting. Um, and yeah. you can actually be more decentralized as an operator yeah. um, because you don't require as many touch points. Yeah. So I think there's like, uh, I think there's a lot of really interesting stuff on the horizon for the mining industry. Yeah. I think it's gonna look really different in a year or two from what it does today. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, for us, it's making sure that we can operate efficiently, keep the lights on, um, grow to 23, and then from there, it's looking at some of these other interesting expansion opportunities. Okay, one follow-up on that. What sort of countries are you specifically looking at? If there's any alpha yet about yeah. that? Because there, there are a lot of countries that, UAE, I've heard that one pop up a few times, or just mm -hmm. like in the Arabian Peninsula. I've heard a lot of chatter about that. Um, Bitfarms is obviously exploring a lot of Argentina, and then... Yeah. Uh, there's other places as well. Europe doesn't look great because energy rates. Kazakhstan seems a little unstable. Every yep. few months there's a tax issue. Yep. China's doing its thing with like a little bit of hash rate. Mm -hmm. Where are you guys looking at if you if you can leak some alpha? Where are you guys looking at? <laughs> um, I like your via negativa approach of like, mm -hmm. let's take the world and we'll check off the countries <laughs> not to go to. Trying to narrow it yeah, down for you. Yeah. Um, yeah, like not Germany, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be rough there. Um, probably. Um, yeah, I mean, I can't say the name of specific regions, but mm -hmm. the way that you sort of outlined it makes sense. Like yeah. the way I share philosophy. So you want stable regime. That's yeah. probably the most important piece. Um, you know, you don't want to build a several hundred million dollar Bitcoin mining facility and then have a bunch of guys in AK-47s pull up and be like, thanks for all the Bitcoin miners, yeah. right? Yeah. So stable regime is huge. Um, and then... Uh, this idea of um, really seasonal power usage mm -hmm. is another one. Um, and then I kind of tease like places that uh, were hot and dusty yeah. or maybe you can't mine uh, yeah. or you couldn't mine with air cooled effectively, yeah. but maybe with immersion. Um, I'll leave it at that. Cool. Perfect. Charlie, thank you so much for joining us yeah. on the Mining Pod. Thanks for having me.